Well, hello everybody. My name is Becky Metcalf, and on behalf of Design Centre Chelsea Harbour, a very warm welcome to Conversations and Craft. This is our series of talks that has been devised especially for our Artifact uh, Contemporary Craft Fair. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, if I could ask you to turn off your phones because the session's being recorded, that would be completely brilliant. Well, past and present, this is a good title for today's session. Um, it's a really busy week for craft, so we are so honoured and so lucky that um, we've got such a brilliant panel. Uh, Deborah Ray, Mary Lewis, Deborah Pocock and Chris Eckersley are all here. And who better to speak to them than Grant Gibson? You probably know him, fantastic writer, podcaster of Material Matters. Um, and I think we should give all of them a very warm welcome. Thank you very much. That's very kind. We haven't done anything yet, but that's uh, that's lovely. Um, yeah, we have a really good panel, which I won't reintroduce because uh, Becky's already done the introduction thing. But they're covering a lot of bases. We have uh, designer and artist. We have journalists. We have people that run important craft organisations. So I'm hoping we get a range of perspectives on this notion of skill, uh, maintaining and keeping skills, and how important that is in a society that's going increasingly digital. Um, they're going to tell you a little, about a little bit about themselves. I'm really keen to learn a little bit about you. Uh, and there are two reasons for this. One of which is it's always good to know who we're talking to. And the other one is I'm looking for a kind of to get you used to doing that as a kind of muscle memory thing. Because there's going to be a point where I'm, I'm going to hope to get questions from the floor. I've got to have a range of hands just to find out who you are. Do we have uh, makers in the audience? Yeah, go on, go on, put it up. Yeah, feel confident about who you are and what you're doing. We've got a couple. Oh, I've started an argument here. <laughs> um, do we have, uh, do we have um, designers? Oh, you, you're, you are busy. Um, do we have uh, ooh, curators? Uh, nice to see you. Media type people, other than Debica? No? So you can say what you like, panel. Uh, anybody get off the lift on the wrong side or in the room and too embarrassed to leave now? No. OK, cool. Well, I don't know who some of you are, but I'm sure we'll find out as this goes on. So look, let's get the panel to introduce themselves first, and then I will pick up some threads, and we will see um, how we get on in the next 45 minutes or so. So, Debica, do you want to introduce yourself? OK. Um, apparently, I'm the only journalist in the room. I'm Debica Ray. I have been a journalist for the past 17 years, mainly writing about architecture and design and craft um, for publications including national newspapers like the FT and the Guardian, but for Al Jazeera, and then also for a lot of specialist publications like Icon, uh, Architectural Digest, Wallpaper, Kinfo. Um, I'm specifically interested in uh, material culture from a kind of global perspective and interested in diasporic communities around the world. Um, which is why I started a magazine called Clove uh, in 2017, which is about South Asian diasporic culture um, and has slightly evolved from being a magazine into a kind of talks program and cultural platform in general. Um, at the moment, I'm acting editor of Crafts Magazine, which is the magazine published by the Crafts Council. Um, the Crafts Council was founded in 1972 to support uh, the UK craft sector, and I suppose the magazine... Uh, which was founded the next year, which means it's 50 next year, um, has a slightly broader remit in my eyes, which is to kind of contextualize and communicate craft in a global sense. So we give a platform to makers from around the world and we situate conversations about craft in a kind of wider context, looking at everything from how it relates to sustainability, to mental health, to kind of globalization, automation, uh, politics. Um, and our May June issue, I think, is really pertinent to this current subject. Um, I named my editorial Back to the Future, partly just because it's a good movie. <laughs> um, also, uh, because a lot of the, the makers that we feature and a lot of the features pick up on this idea of the past and the present and craft being a thread that links through um, and looks to the future as well. Um, and I should say also Crafts of the Magazine that Grant edited not, long, not so long ago. Oh, it was ages ago. It was ages ago. But yes, I um, did. Yeah. Anyway, so that's me. Very good. Thank you, Debka. <laughs> Mary. Hi, I'm Mary Lewis. I'm the Endangered Crafts Manager with Heritage Crafts. 
So Heritage Crafts is a charity founded in 2010 and is the UK advocacy body for traditional heritage crafts. We're also a membership organisation, so you can join. It's very cheap. Um, I am specifically responsible for the Red List <coughs> Endangered Crafts, so I do the research and I also do various projects to support and promote heritage craft skills um, and raise awareness of heritage crafts. Um, there are 244 crafts on this list. Not all of them are endangered, but at the moment, 130 are considered either critically endangered or endangered. Um, heritage Crafts is also um, a UNESCO NGO accredited um, for intangible cultural heritage. So I'm sure we're going to come on to that a bit more later on. I think we might. <laughs> Deborah. Um, good morning. Uh, my name is Debbie Pocock. I'm the CEO of Quest, which is the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Trust. We're a grant giving charity um, founded some 30 years ago, and we provide funding to individual um, craftspeople, makers, uh, to further their training and education in their craft skill. Um, to date, we've supported uh, around 650 individuals, so an amazing alumni community of craftspeople. Um, and we continue to add around 40 or 50 uh, scholarships uh, a year. So our, our family is growing. Um, we support all sorts of different crafts. We interpret craft very broadly. Um, and if you want to get a, a flavor of the types of skills that we support, um, if you go downstairs into onto the uh, ground floor, you'll see some of our um, Quest, Quest scholars there. But as I say, it's a microcosm of what we actually support. And in addition to the funding for training and education, we um, support our alumni by showcases such as downstairs, but you know promote them via our social media channels. Um, and um, you know, part, uh, we have a wide network of partners that we that we work with to help them. And we also partner with Cockpit, which I'm sure some of you are aware of, the wonderful um, maker studio and business incubation centre in London. Um, in terms of uh, supporting our scholars with business skills, um, which is obviously uh, crucial for them to have commercially viable businesses. Thank you. Very good. Chris, last but by no means least. Uh, my name's Chris Eckersley. <clears throat> I'm an artist and designer. Um, I'm also a maker. Um, my original training was in fine art sculpture. Um, I subsequently did a, a postgraduate degree in, in design at Central St. Martins. And then I decided, I'd always been very interested in making things, so I set up a workshop back in the day. Uh, I started making furniture um, because I thought people would buy furniture, and, and luckily they did. Um, I, was, I, was, I was lucky at the, at the beginning because I got a, a very early on, I got a, a big break from heels. Tottenham Court Roads, and they commissioned me to design and make some furniture for them. And that got me into the idea of ma making batch production rather than making one-offs. Um, and things moved on. I, I got more people to help me in my workshop. I ended up with about a dozen people in the end um, and ran a very busy furniture-making shop for about 20 years. Um, later on, I decided I didn't want to be an employer anymore. Um, and so I had a, changed everything around. And by that time, I'd got enough work coming in that was just design work, um, designing for, for small manufacturers and also for Again, people like Heels and the Conman Shop <coughs> and London retailers. Um, I think the reason that I'm here today is because in, I've always been interested in a, the connection between design and contemporary design and traditional craft. And in 2010, I set up a project called Bodging Milano, which is the bodging part is the, the, the name for traditional greenwood chair making. And the Milano part is 
taking stuff and exhibiting it at the Milan Furniture Fair. And I set up this project with Rory Dodd from Designers Block, uh, where a group of us, a group of designers, booked ourselves in on a, a Greenwood chair making course. Um, we were completely out of our comfort zone. We'd got no, no drawing boards, no, no electricity, uh, an, an earth toilet, no, <laughs> no running water. Um, and at the end of the week, we put everything on the van and took it over to, to Milan. And this was just originally intended to be a one-off event, but somehow it took on a bit of a life of its own. Um, and it, it, still, it still lives on. What happened is, just to make this clear, because I always have to make this clear, is it quickly morphed from a Greenwood making project into a, more of a design-based project on what I call bodge thinking, which is an immediate design by immediately making something rather than planning it out too much. Um, and the, the, the project goes on. I was just saying to Grant before we, we came um, we, before we came in, I recently, due to the lockdown, I've gone actually back to where I started uh, because a lot of design work dried up. And so I've gone back now to spending half my time actually making stuff myself again in a little workshop. Very good. We know who everybody is now, which is great. Um, so let's, let's get into a heated debate, shall we? Um, uh, and kick off. <coughs> You will have um, this red list pamphlet on your chair. Mary, this is what you're responsible for. Um, oh, I like the way you're picking it up and having a leaf through as well. That's very good. <laughs> Can we talk about some of the things that are on it and what you're trying to achieve with this list? Um, cricket ball making, yeah. for instance, is now extinct in the UK. Yeah. Um, cricket. It, one could argue that, that, that cricket is probably a more, the future cricket is a more pressing issue. Should we worry <laughs> that people aren't making lacrosse sticks any longer in wood when actually everybody's using them, is, they're using them in carbon fibre, surely? Well, I think if you take each individual craft on its own, mm. then maybe each one is not so significant, but when you look at them as a whole body of skill and knowledge and embodied knowledge, even if they're not um, you know, significant, having significant economic value um, or um, utilitarian value anymore, they will still have significance to those communities that use them, that recognise them. They will have um, to the people who use them, who might want to mend them. You know, there's all these other things that come along with um, embodied craft skill. That's not just about the kind of utilitarian value of that particular mm. object. So um, we try to focus more on the embodied skills and knowledge really than it than on the uh, the objects themselves because um we present it like this because we wanted to present a snapshot of the sector what is the state of the sector what health what's the health of the sector and so really we present it as as what it is um it's an opportunity so you can view it either as a doom laden list of things <laughs> of things that are being lost or you can see it as a list of opportunities and a rich um, illustration of our cultural heritage that exists in all these amazing people who are beavering away in their workshops and sheds. Yeah. Does that answer the question? It does. I mean, because I, I guess one of the criticisms down the years, which you've kind of assuaged yeah. a little bit in that, is that it's more interested, that the list itself is more interested in the object rather than the skill. Yeah. But that you, you would argue that's not the case. But there are yeah. a, a lot of objects. <clears throat> yes, there are. Here. But the, the, you know, it actually lists the skill. So it's brilliant cutting. It's barometer making. And, and so we will lose some of these. That's just that's normal crafts evolve and change over time. Where they are going to pass into history, then we can celebrate them in order to record them. Mm. Um, but ideally, we'd continue them in some capacity or other because they might be niche, but all of these crafts on this list still represent somebody working. You know, we don't need lots of astrophysicists. We just need a few. Just need a few of each to, <laughs> you know, to keep these skills alive. Yeah, okay. Cricket ball making and astrophysics. I didn't think they'd get in the same... same uh, I don't know why that came into my head. But it was... <laughs> yeah. Is it a doom-laden thing or is it a list of opportunities as far as you're concerned? 
Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I would agree on, on the point you made about focusing on the object too much. I think um, we have a tendency to do that probably because we have sentimental attachments to objects and, you know, maybe magazines are to blame partly because we fetishize beautiful <laughs> objects in so, in so many ways. But I think, you know, for me, I, I'm not interested in the cross sticks necessarily per se. I'm sure some people have sentimental attachments to them, but I think, you know, my approach to this tends to be about thinking about the human first and the fact that crafts and making mean something for people's livelihoods, for communities, for kind of personal fulfillment and well-being. And I think that's a more useful way of looking at it rather than, and I appreciate the reasons for having a list of them, which, which you've explained really eloquently. But um, yeah, I think that for me, it's almost, it's not really relevant necessarily whether the specific object continues to exist or or even in a way the specific practice but you know it's about what whether if something's meaningful to people or to a community there's there must be a value in in preserving those and then the question then remains what do we value and how do we then go about um sustaining these things which organizations like mm -hmm. both of yours do very well um but then we also need need to be thinking wider i think in terms of how does education policy fit into this? How does investment in practices that we think are worthwhile, um, how does that work? And I think, you know, responsibility from people like me to communicate the value of these things and nurture a kind of appreciation because ultimately it's about what we value as a society as a whole that's going to sustain particular practices. It's an interesting one because I remember the, the very first launch of this, which was in the House of Commons, yeah. 12 years ago or something and and I was I was very um, I, I was kind of underwhelmed I, I felt craft we needed to be pushing have a vision of the future and how these skills could fit into a contemporary society but actually it transpired the media the wider media they love this stuff right yeah and that's what's been the most <clears throat> important impact of it mm. is that it is a really valuable advocacy tool and we would agree that we um, and it was criticized in the early days for being inescapably negative i mean that's mm. what it is i mean it is we present things as as dying but actually um what it's done is it's stimulated a lot of debate it's stimulated a lot of um interest can i give an example go on <laughs> i've got a prop <laughs> and it i love props yeah it, it relates a bit to the bodging as well so well it is oh. bodging so this is, um, mm. this is a bowl that was turned on a pole lathe with a foot treadle lathe, so it's a human-powered um, bowl. This was an extinct craft from the 1950s to the 1990s, and it was recovered. Um, and there are now hundreds of people doing this. It's not even on the endangered list anymore. It's considered viable. Um, and How many people do you need to be doing it for it to be viable? Um, it depends on the craft. Um, we have a range of criteria. It's not okay. just numbers that we yeah, assess yeah. it on. It's on the trajectory as well. Okay. So this is, um, there are now hundreds of people doing this. There's even a festival you can go to specifically to make pole lathe turned bowls. So um, in terms of why we do them now, we don't do them for the same reasons that we, as we would have done in the past. You know, we don't do them because we need pole lathe turned bowls anymore. We do them because they're beautiful humble objects but also for the community of makers that get together to do it they do it in the woods it's about health and well-being it's about wanting to take part in an authentic experience all those other things that we do crafts for and i think that's a great success story for what can happen to an mm. extinct craft and how it can be revived mm. Mm. debbie from quest point of view skills shortage of skills these skills on these lists does this worry you what's what's the quest the quest line on this um <clears throat> Actually, it doesn't worry me. And I, I, I think, you know, the, the Red List um, is a really important piece of work. And what it's done is actually raised the profile of craft generally. It's raised the conversation around craft. And absolutely, people did sort of focus on the negative and the last of. But from our perspective, you know, Quest as a, as a grant-giving charity has supported a number of people on this list. And I think it's about you know, the evolving traditions of craft. And so someone like, I'm going to give an example, because you know, someone like Catherine Husky, who is a, a really uh, amazing uh, female glass blower, and she came to Quest and said, I really want to introduce neon into my work. And neon is on that list. And I think that's a really good example of how people 
um, you know, come to us, enhance their skills, and are thinking about how they evolve their traditional skills. Um, and there's lots of other examples. We've supported kilt makers. I mean, kilt making is an endangered craft. And um, you know, Emma Wilkinson, who we've supported, she said, Debbie, she said, I just want to make kilt making cool. And then she says she's reaching a whole new different audience. Hadn't Vivian Westwood already done that? Um, yes, possibly. <laughs> possibly but not I supporting the traditional kilt makers. Uh, yeah. so <laughs> Exactly. Uh, and there we go. There, there, there's a picture of some, some traditional kilt making. But so I think it's really important that um, we don't talk about endangered. It's about how people are taking their traditional skills and they're involving them and making them relevant for today's um, society um, and all the other good things that comes with making. But we always think from Quest perspective, you know, in the application, um, as well as the skill, absolutely crucial, but is it commercially viable? You know, we want um, our makers um, to have sustainable mm. living from from their practice. So say, say if somebody came to you as a lacrosse stick maker, yeah. would you be saying, make something else? Uh, <clears throat> no, not necessarily, but we would be saying um, what, what skill is involved in making lacrosse mm. sticks, what materials are you using, how is this going to enhance your practice, what's your long-term vision, is this commercially viable? Because it's really, it's, you know, making in a professional sense shouldn't be, you know, just for, for, for the making, it ha you have to make a living from it. Yeah. So, um, so from, from our perspective, that's, that's a really Im important element um, of, yeah, of, of what, what we're supporting. And I, I think that, you know, that evolving tradition of craft and, um, you know, we're talking about traditional skills, but it is how you, you know, you bring um, technology, how you evolve you know, and that's what we're delighted to see. And I think that's the purpose of this mm. list and one of the launch, launch, the really positive things of it. Mm. I think there's also the thorny issue of what we, what we mean by heritage. Yeah. Um, and I mean, yeah. her heritage is Absolutely. in our name, obviously, and we've inherited yeah. this kind of binary between heritage and contemporary to a certain extent, um, which actually isn't always that useful because mm. all crafts being practiced today could be considered contemporary and all crafts have a heritage. So um, I think... We, the way we think about our heritage crafts is it's about actually making an active choice about what elements of it of our heritage is it that we want to take with us to the future. Mm. We're not about looking at um, what elements some, is it. Well, what do you think? It's up to people to decide what oh, elements. Okay. Yeah, okay. because it's not. I mean, there's no one heritage, is it? It's plural. Yeah. You know, whose heritage are we talking about anyway? You know, we've got all different kinds of heritage in this mm. country, um, and that we need to encompass all kinds of different experiences in that. I mean, so. David can talks about diasporas. That's that's yeah. that's one of your many interests. And yeah. are there diaspora crafts? Base crafts on, on there, this list. There are I wonder. some. There are not enough, and we've got more work to do on that definitely. But um, we ho we hope that it can represent all crafts in this country mm. because um, you know everybody crafts important to all kinds of different communities and different people, and we need to represent that. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I also I think there's this. I tend to find this distinction between traditional and contemporary unhelpful and yeah. completely <laughs> arbitrary. I mean, I don't really. When is traditional? I mean, have we just drawn a line somewhere in history and decided mm. that before that, that everything was traditional and then after that, yeah. we're contemporary? What does contemporary mean in craft? Is it just conceptual? Is it, does it have to be digital? Uh, yeah, I, d I don't know whether it's helpful. And I also think there's a lot of associations with certain types of people and certain communities that get lumped into tradition, whether or not they're practicing something that's evolving and, and contemporary and relevant. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's not that useful and um, it's perhaps more useful just to think of everything in a kind of continuum and what the craft is always going to be, as you say, part of a kind of iterative process that's developed over time and there isn't any distinction between those two things. Yeah, yeah. Well, Chris, I'm going to turn to you because you curated an exhibition about eight years ago called Real Craft. Yes. So, so you, you were going to uh, draw <coughs> distinctions and lines. And, and um, I think one of the, the opening sentences you wrote in the piece for Crafts 
um, can't think who was editing it at the time, uh, is you read, it's a popular myth that old skills are dying out. So is it a myth or, so is this list? What, what, well, you know? I, I think it is a, I think it is, <coughs> it is a myth um, because the, the purpose of that, one of, the, one of my aims with that show, that exhibition was, you know, we hear that, that craft is dying out. Um, but I, I didn't see it like that. I just see craft everywhere, um, you know, in, in, in the everyday. So I was just trying to uh, broaden the, the, the definition of craft to some extent by, by meeting, searching out people that were engaged in a highly skilled craft activities but actually didn't regard themselves probably didn't, wouldn't have called themselves craftsmen or craftswomen, didn't regard themselves as special in any way. Um, but they, they were just doing these highly skilled jobs. So it was an mm. exhibition made of, 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 of things like that. Mm. So who was in the show? What kind of real craft were you looking at? Well, um, Crossley Carpets up in Halifax. I mean, one of the things with this is whether machines are involved or not. Mm. Mm. So, and, and I think that that dates back to, to, to William Morris um, and his book, News From Nowhere. And, you know, the sections in that book, which are whatever anybody says, whatever Mary Greenstead says, you know, the, should just preface that, that after Chris wrote this piece of craft, <laughs> uh, there were a number of letters, one of which was from a, uh, a woman called Mary Greenstead, being, being critical of your take <laughs> on William Morris yeah. and, and his relationship with machines. And uh, well, would you, well, let you go, and then we'll see where we end up. Well, you know, <laughs> but William, it's it's in some circles, it's not acceptable to criticise William Morris in any way, what, whatsoever. But, you know, I was, I was having a go at his book, News From Nowhere, where there are several passages in that where, it, uh, you know, if you, if you don't know the book, it's, it's someone who is probably William Morris goes to sleep and he wakes up in the future. And, what's, and it's this wonderful romantic future. And all fa factories and industrial areas have been done away with. And it's presented as a good thing. So, um, you know, this, this, this I, I started looking at what I called real craft, and I didn't mind if machines were involved. Um, and then, I mean, the, 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 the other, the, the other um, firm that I looked at was Gordon Russell Design. Gordon Russell's a very interesting character because he's the person who you know, in my view, is a, a link between the arts and crafts movement and the modern movement. And Gordon Russell famously said, there's nothing wrong with machines, we just need to teach machines manners. <laughs> um, so... Yeah, I mean, I, I would posit, I, I don't particularly want to get into an argument about William Morris at this point, mm. although, I mean, maybe that is, maybe he is the moment, or you think of Bernard Leach, I think, in, in other places, mm. but that is the moment where people talk about the tradition and contemporary, mm. possibly, that's maybe where the line is drawn, I don't know. But he did, I mean, I think Morris's point with machines was that when the machine is taking over the person running it, in other words, you're just punching a button, that that is something that we should not, that, that's his objection to it. But he didn't object to <coughs> people using machines as a tool to enhance their their craft, I, I, I don't think, believe. I think his views led to a, a, a confusion between <coughs> machine production and mass production. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think really he, he, was, he, he was against mass production, probably. Mm. But it sort of has come out that he was, he was anti-machine. Mm. And we have a lot of machine-based crafts on the Red List. And I think that was one of our reasons for um, for being really is exactly what you say that a lot of crafts were carrying on in um, workshops in Sheffield or you know in the jewellery mm. quarter that by people who didn't necessarily perceive themselves to be in possession of any special skill. Yeah. Um, and it's about all of those craft skills and highly yeah. skilled occupations. We could equally have been called the Heritage Trades Association, I think, sometimes because we do yeah. represent a lot of those kind of occupations and weavers and 
the hat trade in Luton and the ceramics industry in Stoke and all those skilled occupations that still require a hand, high level of hand skill but are mechanised mm. to a certain extent. Mm. I think one of the things that I was re reacting against was um, Bernard, Bernard Leach in his mm. The Potter's Book, which I think came out in about 1940. 1940, yeah. Where he specifically... It's just, it's, it's just a book about being a potter, but more or less on the first page, he's advising would-be potters to think of themselves as, art, as potter artists. Mm. Um, and, you know, in, in my view, this was the worst thing that could possibly mm. be said because it, 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 it made craftspeople think that they were somehow more special than they are. <laughs> Um, and, and it, it also <clears throat> res it, it made people um, reluctant to get involved with um, collaborating with I I industry. <clears throat> Devika, there's a wry smile when uh, Chris was talking <laughs> about, about potters, about cross people not being special. Yeah, no, I mean, I was going to say that I think we have this, we have this tendency to... Um, kind of demonize machines, but also mm. romanticize hand skills to a certain extent. Mm. I know it's probably slightly controversial in a craft context, but you know, there's nothing inherently good or bad about either of these things. You know, if you're a person working, making garments in a factory in Rano Plaza in Bangladesh and you're, ha you're using <coughs> your hands, I mean, is that good? Is it better to have a machine available to make your life easier rather than working for, you know, a dollar a day using your hands, and you know, we may love that it's made in Bangladesh by someone handcrafted, but there's nothing inherently good about that, nor is there anything inherently bad about a machine making your life easier. I think we need to kind of take this sentimental attachment to this idea of tradition out of it to a certain extent. We've kind of we valorized the past and without kind of necessarily valuing it and in, in the way that we should. It, it, there's no sentiment in this list then. Um, well, I mean, there probably is. I mean, people do respond to it sentimentally. Mm. But um, I think from our point of view, what we're, <clears throat> what we're trying to present is sort of on a related point is that um, we're talking about the object itself, is that I suppose where we um, try and position ourselves is where a lot of craft is about a sort of unique expression of the individual craft person. So um, creating a beautiful, unique object. Um, but whereas a lot of the craft people in this list, they may be making a hundred things the same and they're that notion of creative is very different. Mm. You know, they're making, the skill is in make. If you're making a clarinet, then you're not trying to innovate. You're trying to make that clarinet mm. exactly the same. You might be making refinements and improving your process and things, but that it, there isn't, it is not creative in the same sense of making a yes, unique it's, object. It's, it's not a Leachian yeah. uh, studio so, piece um, of work. Absolutely. So we, I um, mean, the, the, un, the underpinning skills are the same. Well, that's you know, like whether that you call themselves an artist, would you say? Or I think they call themselves a, a maker mm -hmm. or a craftsperson. I don't. You know, I, we allow people to self-identify, <laughs> 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 um, and, and with heritage and contemporary, or both. You know, as well. But I think that it's that. Um, what we're trying to argue for is that you know whether you're make, whether you're working in a factory making silver objects that are all exactly the same, mm. or whether you're making one-off bespoke silver items, those silver, the underpinning skills are the same. And um, by not focusing on those skills, um, th those fundamental underpinning skills, we risk the opportunities for the future creation of those unique objects. If, mm. You know, if we don't have those, some of those specialist skills that only exist in five silversmithing mm. businesses in the country now, um, we won't be able to create those amazing objects in the future. And it's, it sort of erodes those top level skills and we can't, you know, they're hard to get back once you've lost them. Yeah, no, well, other than... Go on, Debbie, sorry. Yeah. You, you're no, that, about to but jump in. Hard, but that's 30 years to get yeah, yeah, yeah. to recover yeah, yeah. that craft. Yeah. I, I mean, I suppose... I mean, not exactly talking about the past, you know, talking about the future. I mean, you also make a very good point, you know, in putting this piece of work together. It is about how we pass on skills to the next generation, mm. because that's absolutely crucial. You know, the reason that some of these are, you know, we were talking earlier about the why, this is a list, but mm. why some of these uh, crafts are actually um, dying out. I don't like to use that phrase, but it's because there aren't um, people to take over some mm. of those skills. And so I think, you know, 
quest and, and, and for me personally, it is about how we actually inspire and engage the next generation of mm. makers. Who are these future people who are going to pick up these skills and, mm. and want to uh, continue with them? And uh, I think that's mm. one of the challenges mm. yeah. is, you know, yeah. Was it, was that, was that, yeah. That was going to be my next question. Oh, sorry. No, yeah. that's absolutely perfect. The yeah. less I do, the better, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, so we've got a list. We've got some fantastic PR. There's this uh, Sky Art show that's coming out with uh, Vic Reeves fronting it about lost skills. Mm. So people recognise there's an issue. This list continues to grow, I'm yeah. guessing. So then how do we stop, change, uh, and prevent these skills from disappearing? Well, I mean, one thing we hear a lot is that young people aren't interested in doing these things mm. anymore, mm. which I think is a very lazy assumption. Yeah. Um, and I think, how can you be interested if you don't know about them? Exactly. So this is part of the thing is that, you know, we need to know about them. We need to know even, you know, if they're niche occupations, you know, at least it might inspire people to, to have a go, whether they do it as a hobby or whether they do it as a career, that's fine. Um, but it's, it's just... And a good example is clock making. Mm. So clock making, the people who run clock <coughs> ma making and restoration businesses are very busy. We have a lot of clocks, but there are literally no new entrants coming into the trade mm. at the moment. Virtually none. So that will start to become and an there, issue. And there are no new entrants because they're not learning about it at school? Because or there's what? no pathway for them to, yeah. to enter. You know, there's, vir there's virtually no support. There's no, there's no learning pathways for them. And why would, you know, why would they know about it? Mm. I mean, the repair shop's done a really good job on that. You know, mm. you know, I think the repair shop's done more for horology than, mm. um, <laughs> than any other organisation recently. But you know, that's it's these kind of things that actually showing, you know, why and how yeah. these skills could be. So could at T levels, them. the new T level, yeah. is that going to make a, is that going to make a difference? Who wants to dedicate your eyebrows? No, no, it's a bit, have, it's yeah. like bidding at an auction. <laughs> <laughs> if you move, I'm going to ask you something. I'm probably not the best person to really <laughs> comment on that. I mean, I mean, I don't comment on craft and, and you're a journalist. You can yeah, comment on anything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think yeah, obviously it's a good place to start. I think we need to. I mean, I would say I'm I'm probably maybe naively quite optimistic about mm. about hand skills not dying out. I think mm. that as we kind of move further into automation and a kind of era of computers doing everything, we're valuing these things more. And I think people, you know, some, one thing a computer can't do is make something by hand, obviously, mm. and that's never going to change. And, and, you know, T levels, yes, of course, policy needs to get us there. But I think that mm. we are going to, in the long game, I think I'm optimistic that mm. these are the things that will survive, creativity and doing things by mm. hand. Mm. Yet humans will exist in the, in the end and, mm. and it, we won't be replaced. But maybe I'm being... Optimistic. <laughs> oh, can we concentrate on education for a moment? Uh, Quest, do you have a point of view on, on T levels or how, how we can change the, the education system to encourage? Because it seems to me there are two things. I mean, you're saying that they can't, they don't have any knowledge. But if there's a market, if there's a thriving yeah. market and there are jobs, then surely people would go to these things. So it's, it's, there's two ends of the telescope, I guess. Yeah, but it's not all market driven. I think, I mean, I think it, it needs to be driven by other things as well. Mm. We need to recognise mm. them as culturally valuable mm. as well as, as yeah. just market driven. But it was mm. Debbie's point. No, no, that. I absolutely agree. I mean, you know, you, you talked about the repair shop. I mean, there has been an absolute explosion of, mm. of craft in the last few years. And actually, I think that's one of the positive things, if I can say that, that's come out of the pandemic. You know, people have got creative at home, and we've seen Tom Daly knitting. You, you talked about say Tom that. Daly. I know well, you <laughs> talked about that in that brilliant article. And I think that's all really important for, for craft. And, you know, again, this goes back to this sort of idea of, of that in a domestic setting and all of the good things that, about creativity and making. But, you know, it's then how you take that sort of inspiration and engagement and that route to becoming a professional maker. And I think that's the challenge. You know, I don't, I don't want to, um, you know, get in too much to about, about education and advocacy, but we know that in schools, generally, creativity and art is quite low down the agenda. And, and unless you are showing young people and telling young people that actually you can make a living from uh, being a 
craftsperson maker they're they're going to be influenced by what their peers are telling them their family their 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 teachers so i d i do think that um you know there does need to be a pretty fundamental step change mm. um and, and and quest um you know I, I can i can say this i think it's the next thing for us as a charity we want to involve and of course you know we're supporting people who are highly skilled the sort of top of the pyramid and we're thinking okay well how do we drive people into the bottom mm. of the pyramid get them excited engaged where do they go mm. from there and and you know there are some incredible institutions you know i think about west dean actually mm. and you talking about clock making and i was there last week and there was a young guy that he really was quite young and he was he was busy making a clock at his bench and i said how did you how did you get into this because it you 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 shouldn't but you when you see a young person doing this sort of very you, you, somehow you're always quite taken aback and he said well so when I was two and a half, um, my <laughs> my um, my grandpa used to uh, show me how to wind his clocks, and of course it's wonderful to have that influence if you're lucky enough to have that influence. But not all young people have access to that kind of, of influence. So I do think it's a, it's a fundamental issue. But and also I think engagement as well, just to build on that, is not yeah. just about people who are going to end up being makers because the. Yeah ecosystem of craft depends on people buying it yes. and doing it as hobbies and learning Absolutely. and all of those things as well so i'll come back to my bowl yeah. this was made by sharif adams who's a pro yeah. professional he's on his photos on the screen mm -hmm. who's a professional bowl turner but he teaches loads of people they're not yeah. going to become pole bowl turners no. um he makes tools people yeah. buy the tools they buy yeah. his bowls you know it's they, yeah. all engagement is yes. about driving the sector from the bottom and mm. all those exactly. people it's are important in the sector i'm Absolutely. going to interrupt because the <laughs> clock is just is just which is like, like the clock of doom which means I, I i have to send stuff to the audience because i've only got four minutes and 20 seconds otherwise it's, we all get electrocuted in our chairs if we ever run. um does anybody have any questions the first one's always difficult i know Oh yes, hello. Well, hang on, two seconds. The microphone's coming towards you very, very rapidly. If you could let us, uh, if you could let us know who you are and what you do, that would be great. I'm Annabelle from Fitzland. I'm truly interested in the consumer. Hello, Annabelle. Um, hi. Um, I'm interested in the formation of heritage crafts and what the impetus was to establish the charity. Um, it was in response, really, to um, a lot of heritage craft makers and tradespeople feeling like they weren't, their voice wasn't being represented. That was the so it was a group of makers who got together to form Heritage Crafts initially. Um, several of those people are still involved with the organisation now, um, and it's evolving and changing. But I think that was the initial um, impetus. And it, the first things that we did was to try and raise the profile. So getting traditional crafts people to in the national honours list and awards, and sort of elevating those people who did, hadn't felt recognised as, as much as they could have been. So you, they didn't feel represented by the Crafts Council is fundamentally what you're saying, there, isn't it? I wouldn't say that. Wow, well, it's where you're heading, it's where you're heading. Uh, we've had the difficult first question, so it's like the seal has been broken. The second question, trust me, is much, much easier. Does anybody else have any questions? Yes, coming again, hang on for the mic. Becky is running like a gazelle towards you. Uh, if you could let us know who you are and what you do, that would be fabulous. Thank you. I'm, uh, my name is Matilda and I work in tech. Hello. Um, and I'm studying um, heritage skills and how we can build bridges between tech and heritage skills. Um, and I'm very curious to understand um, from your experience, what is it that is mostly missing if you were to name, you know, the top two difficulties that makers actually face that, you know, um, what, what, what would you say it is? We've, we've named, we've, we've talked about passing on the skills we've talked about access to market and we've talked about engagement but practically you know how does that translate if you were to you know go very be very trivial and say top three issues that we need to address um i think for the in terms of the barriers that crafts people face is that what you you mean yeah, um, I think um, what craft people tell us is that what they need the most support with is um, marketing and profile and awareness raising um, and um, and how to sell. I mean, I think 
Uh, a lot of the issue we have is that people who are good at making things are not necessarily good at, at selling things. Um, and so that's that's quite a big um, lesson. I think that comes as quite a hard blow for a lot of heritage craftspeople, all craftspeople, mm. that, that you know you have to spend more time on selling your stuff than you do on making your stuff. Um, so that is something that we... Is a, is a real barrier and I think that, that you know just generally you know it's quite a tough environment out there for people at the moment um so they are people are struggling um but not everyone and those ones who are savvy and can sell online and get their stuff out there are doing really well come into it Chris you're a kind of practitioner you're making furniture selling furniture do you find that difficult not now but it's because I've been doing it a long time mm. I mean I used to be involved with the when the class council was running the hot house program and I was involved with that, and that was very interesting because um, the, the people, the, the, the people on the on the program were, you know, they, they were taken for granted. They were skilled in their craft, um, but you know, they were they were struggling, um, and and Hot House was was set up to try and help help these people, but it it was it was very very difficult. Um, to you know, I think a lot of them thought there was some magic thing that we could tell them, um, and and there isn't. And I always used to uh, used to say, actually, luck comes into it, and nobody really liked that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I I sincerely believe that, and you know, I I had a few lucky breaks. So that's that's the advice, everybody. <laughs> Think that <laughs> be lucky. Uh, the, the clock, the clock has just gone. It says no seconds. I have to wrap this up. I'm really sorry because I'd like to keep going. Um, but if you could thank Debica, Mary, Debbie, and Chris, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you very much for coming. I think you're right, Grant. I think we could he be here for a lot longer. Gosh, fascinating. Uh, Chris, you said craft is everywhere. But actually, that red list of endangered um, of endangered craft is that great advocacy tool, isn't it? It's stimulating, stimulating debate. It's stimulating interest. And uh, uh, Debbie, I think you said it's in, we need to inspire the next generation of makers. So, lot of things that we learned this afternoon. That, um, and I would like to thank our brilliant panel. Please do go down and have a look at the galleries uh, in downstairs in the Design Avenue um, because there's so much to see and you can really see the beauty of the handmade. Let's give them another round of applause. <laughs> <laughs>